In this lecture, we look at general polynomials and their graphs. A polynomial of degree n is a function of the form f of x is a sub n times x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 times x to the n minus 1 plus and so on with various coefficients a sub i times x to the i, where n here is a non-negative integer. And these coefficients, a sub n and so on, are all real numbers. The integer n, the highest exponent on x, is the degree of the polynomial. And as mentioned briefly, the real numbers in front of the powers of x are called the coefficients of the polynomial. The real number a sub n at the front is the leading coefficient of the polynomial. And the constant term a sub 0 corresponds to the y-intercept of f of x. For example, the polynomial f of x equals this expression has degree 5, leading coefficient 2, and constant term 23. The simplest polynomials are the constant functions, whose graphs are straight lines, and the linear functions, whose graphs are lines. We've already looked at these, along with functions of degree 2, the quadratics. Since f of x does not involve square roots of a variable x, nor does it have denominators involving the variable x, then the domain of a polynomial is the entire real line. In other words, there's nothing like square roots to prohibit uh, various real numbers, and there's nothing like denominators, where you might worry about zero, to prohibit real numbers. So everything is in the domain. Graphs of polynomials are particularly nice. They're continuous without holes or gaps. For example, if we look at uh, these graphs here, the one on the left has a hole or jump at a discontinuity where x is 1. The one on the right is not defined where x is 1. Neither of these graphs, in neither of these graphs is the function continuous, so these could not be the graphs of polynomials. Because the graph of a polynomial is continuous, it obeys the intermediate value theorem. This means that if the function takes on a particular y value in one place and a different y value in another place, then the function takes on all possible y values between the two. More explicitly, suppose we have a and b as two real numbers where the function at a is less than the function at b. So the two y values there are different. Then given any real number u between those two y values, there's an x value c between a and b, so that c is the y value associated with u. Continuous functions, such as polynomials, cover all the y values between f of a and f of b. In other words, all the values intermediate to f of a and f of b. So this is the intermediate value theorem. Continuous functions, such as polynomials, cover all y values intermediate to f of a and f of b. Here's a picture from Wikipedia displaying this relationship. In this picture, the horizontal green lines represent f of a and f of b. Notice how f of b is at the top and f of a is below. And consider any y value between f of a and f of b. For example, the y value u represented by a horizontal red line. The graph in blue is a continuous function, and that graph has to have some x value c whose y value is u. Graphs of polynomials are also smooth. They have no sharp corners or cusps. In the picture below, the graph on the left has a sharp corner at the point 1, 1. The graph on the right has a cusp at the origin. Neither of these graphs could be the graph of a polynomial. These graphs are not smooth. Polynomials, graphs of polynomials are smooth. So the following properties of a polynomial should be visible in the graph. The domain is all the real numbers. The function is continuous. The function is smooth. Let's consider the simplest polynomials, the so-called power functions, like f of x equals x, or x squared, x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the fifth, and so on. All of these, um, my function is simply x to the n, some power of n. We're going to look at the n behavior of these functions. All of these functions have some form, like either f of x equals x cubed, or f of x equals x to the fourth. If the exponent on a power function is even, then the y values will go off to infinity, shoot up to infinity, whether x is going off to the left to negative infinity or off to the right. As we move away from the y-axis, the function will begin to rise, the y values will begin to rise. 
we say that behavior at infinity, or the end behavior of the polynomials, looks like this picture. It's shooting up to the left and shooting up to the right. This mimics the action of the graph away from the x-axis. This is my drawing for the end behavior of a polynomial like x squared or x to the fourth. If the degree of the polynomial is even, but the leading coefficient is negative, then the end behavior mimics that of a power function reflected across the the x-axis. The end behavior should look like this reflection, that, that is, it'll look like this picture. Imagine the parabola y equals x squared, shooting up. If we look at y equals minus x squared, it will shoot down and we'll have this end behavior. On the other hand, if the graph is y equals x cubed, or a similar graph where the exponent on x is an odd power, such as y equals x cubed or y equals x to the fifth, then our graph will look like this. As we move out from the y-axis, move off to the left, we drop down. As we move off to the right, we shoot up. We'll draw this picture of these two arrows to indicate the end behavior. As you move away to the left, you drop. As you move away to the right, you rise. <coughs> For a general polynomial, the leading term will begin to, to dominate the graph as x grows in absolute value, as x moves away from the y-axis. So if we're given a graph of a polynomial like this, y equals 2x to the fifth plus some other terms, the end behavior of that graph will look like y equals x to the fifth. The end behavior of the fifth degree polynomial, 2x to the fifth plus smaller terms, is the end behavior of x to the fifth because as x gets large, x to the fifth is much, much larger than anything involving x to the fourth or x cubed or x squared. So there's what our end behavior for that graph, y equals 2x to the fifth plus 23x to the fourth minus 77x to the third and so on looks like. And if the leading coefficient is negative, then the end behavior of polynomial will just be flipped over. For example, the graph of this uh, polynomial rises off to the left as we move away to the left, and it drops off to the right as we move away to the right. When x is large in absolute value, this polynomial, minus 2x to the fifth plus smaller terms, just begins to look a lot like minus 2x to the fifth. A polynomial of even degree and positive leading coefficient, such as this one, has in behavior like that. Since it drops from the left as we get close to the y-axis and then rises far off to the right, this polynomial has to turn around. In fact, it has to turn around an odd number of times. The local maximums and minimums, where the graph changes direction, are called turning points, and the number of turning points gives us some clue to the degree of the polynomial. In particular, the number of turning points is always less than the degree. Imagine a polynomial of degree 2, a quadratic. It turns around once, what we call the vertex. The number of turning points is always less than the degree. For example, here's a degree 4 polynomial. It crosses the x-axis four times. If you look at the picture, it crosses the x-axis near minus 1.7, near minus 0.4, near 1, and near 1.25. And so it has three turning points. This graph, if, if we look to the far left, it's dropping, goes below the x-axis, and then somewhere around minus 1.25, it turns around, and heads back up, reaches the top, drops back again, and then shoots back up, turning around three times uh, near minus 1.3, near 0 0.2, and near 1.1. Sometimes a pair of turning points of a graph can merge or disappear. Consider this polynomial, x to the fourth minus 3x squared plus x plus 1, which we were just looking at, and if we start changing the coefficients of x squared, we start getting different graphs, and we'll show you in a moment that a pair of turning points of the original graph begin to merge and disappear. So turning points can disappear. When they do that, they'll, they'll disappear two at a time. So let's uh, watch this. Um, this graph, as we just drew, has turning points around minus 1.5, or 0 0.25, or 1.2, turns around three times. It drops, then goes back up, then drops again, goes back up. But if I change that minus 3x squared to minus 2x squared, I get this graph. It still has three turning points, but one of them is a little bit softer and more subtle. 
This graph, if I change them, that minus 3x squared to minus x squared, now seems to have lost two of the turning points, and it drops down to around x equals minus 1, and then it just rises after that. If I throw out the x squared term completely, it's clear that this fourth degree polynomial, instead of having three turning points, just has one. Let's see these again. Three turning points of a degree four polynomial softening into one turning point. There's my original one with three turning points. Three turning points seems to have probably just one turning point, definitely just one turning point. Let's do this quick exercise. Consider the graph of this polynomial below. How many turning points does it have? And what do you think is the degree? Number of turning points seems to be five. It drops, rises, drops, rises, drops, and rises. And so what should be the degree of the polynomial? It should be six. In the next lesson, we explore the fundamental theorem of algebra and also look at sign diagrams.